All right, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Celeste LeCompte. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for ProPublica. We're a nonprofit news organization. Um, I want to start by telling you something that you may not know, which is that in 2016, we did not have an election. What we actually had was 8,000 elections around the country. So in the US, we do not actually have a sort of major federal election, which is how elections are run. They're run not even at the state level, but instead they're run at the county level. So in 2016, our news organization, ProPublica, was looking at what were we going to do in terms of covering investigative and accountability reporting angles for this election. And we uh, realized that if we were going to look at issues around what prevented people from voting in the US, we probably couldn't do it by ourselves. Um, the laws that were changing were changing at a state by state level. There are different rules that permit people to vote in different ways in every one of these counties. And so we started to say, okay, how do we do this? And the answer is something that we often come to at ProPublica is to say, we will do this with partners. So um, we formed a project called Election Land, and that's what we're mostly gonna be talking about here today, uh, which was the single largest one day collaborative journalism project ever. Um, we had more than 200 newsrooms participating, um, uh, dozens of journalism school, a dozen journalism schools, lots of tech company partners, including Slack, who were working with us, and a bunch of nonpartisan voter support organizations to help us figure this all out. So um, how exactly did we pull it all off um, is what we're gonna talk about today. So here to talk about this are my co-panelists, and I'm gonna start with John Keefe, um, who was with WNYC and was one of our first partners on the project. So I, can you hear me? Yes? Um, hi, I'm Matt Quartz. I am a bot developer and product manager at Quartz. Uh, we're doing a lot with Slack, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and I was one of the people uh, uh, who, along with Simon and folks at ProPublica, set up this system to uh, bring in all of this information from around the country. So what we're trying to do was detect problems at the polls. So this would be primarily long lines, Long lines not only are a good indication that something's amiss at the poll, maybe not enough staffers, maybe something wrong, uh, they also tend to dissuade people from voting. If you show up, it's your lunch break, there's a three hour wait, you're more likely to not vote um, than if there's no wait. Um, so that's what we were looking for. We were using social media, Google Trends, and lots of other ways to try to detect this across the country. What was particularly interesting for me at that, uh, going into this project, at the time I worked at the local public radio station in New York City and had been there for many years. And for any journalist who covers an election, the issue of a problem at a polling site usually doesn't come to your ears until late in the day. It's for some reason, down the road, you'll hear about, oh, there was a problem in the Bronx, or there was something wrong with, in this little place in Brooklyn, or, or whatnot. It's true in whatever community you're in. The issue with an election day uh, coverage of this issue is that the end of the day is too late to know about that. Uh, you need to know early in the day, and you need to get that information about problems to journalists on the ground who have sources in city government or maybe they can actually go to the site themselves and actually find out what's going on, what's maybe wrong, and what could be done to fix it before the election is over. So this was not a project about covering the election um, and the voting and then reporting on it the next day in the newspaper or on TV. This was about covering it in real time. Um, and so that's sort of the framework for what we were trying to accomplish. And another partner of ours, Simon Rogers. Yes. So um, I work at the Google News Lab, which is this bit of Google that's kind of like a bridge between the news industry and this giant kind of, you know, anonymous company. And um, my area is data. I run a small data journalism team. We've got about seven people, and we create content around Google data, most of which is Google Trends and Google Search data. Well, obviously, we've got access to things like YouTube and Waze and so on as well. And with this project, it was really interesting because in my previous life as a, as a reporter, I've reported on elections, albeit not in the, the US, and there is always that thing that on the day itself, 
really the story is the vote because you don't get results till the middle of the night. So really it's about how people are voting and often those stories are kind of random good luck on the part of the reporter that they can find the place where there's, there's an issue. Then we have access to search data and search data is an incredibly powerful social signal. If suddenly lots of people in a town are searching way above the average for things like long lines or broken voting machines or provisional ballots, these other kind of terms that come up on election day when there's an issue. Maybe it's an indicator of something. Maybe it's a way to act as like a tip-off that can then be investigated by reporters. So with this particular project, and we felt that firstly it was just a great reporting project on the day. It was a way to support a lot of reporters on the day. And the way it took off and the fact that there, were, there was a 1,000 reporters involved in it shows that it, it was something that people needed to have done. But also, we felt that maybe this is an area where trends data could help. So we built kind of tools to bring that data into into the storytelling process where we were looking and we spent weeks and months on trying to find the right kind of formulation of data but really looking for these big issues of things like long lines, maybe voter intimidation, broken voting machines, provisional ballots and so on. And, and we also worked with Pitch Interactive who are based over there in Oakland um, who built us a really good map which would show this stuff in real time and show where there were patterns. And we did find there were these kind of patterns emerging you'd hear about long lines in Georgia, I think, and then suddenly there would be all these kind of long lines flashing up in Georgia, and we'd hear about broken voting machines um, in Wisconsin, and, and, and there would also, it was also showing up in search as well. So it was a way to kind of back up the data. So on the day itself, we were all sitting together in this, in this room in uh, CUNY in New York, um, running this kind of incredible news gathering operation. Yeah. Um... So one of the other sources of data that we had was not just um, social media data and signals from Google search, but we also had access to a database put together by an organization that does uh, voter support on election day. So if you're having a problem voting, you can call 1-866-R-VOTE and somebody there will help you resolve whatever your problem is. Um, they made a lot of that data available to us as a news operation that was going to be feeding information to reporters around the country to get the word out about potential problems that could affect other voters and all of these things. But um, we had this huge range of different kinds of information that we needed to distribute out to newsrooms literally all over the country. Uh, when we were working to build a list of partner news organizations for the project, we looked at where there had been a history of voting problems, where there tended to be long lines that academic researchers had studied in the past, and we found counties in basically every single state where we expected there to be some kind of issue, and we found uh, news organizations that covered those areas to work with us uh, as sort of the foundation, and then we grew that network of people from there. Um, but then the challenge was figuring out how do we actually share information among this crazy, insane group of people with this uh, huge number of data resources, uh, all of which are coming from different streams. So, uh, John, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about how we manage that? Yeah, so you might guess that um, there's this software platform that's really cool, that's good for collaborating, <laughs> helped a lot. Uh, Slack, uh, and you know, I've said this a couple times, there's no way we could have done it without Slack. Um, it just wouldn't, we were talking, we were trying to conceive of how we would have done it, it would have been impossible. So two main things that I think worked uh, with this collaboration and the communication part of it, two things we did, one, uh, teamed up with Slack and they were super helpful with us, um, and also decided to have a sort of a nerve center of about 100 people located in uh, right near Times Square in, at the at, uh, CUNY Graduate School of Journalism where we all got together and sh uh, were able to communicate a hundred of us per person to person but then also be able to, we we're also even in that room communicating over Slack. Um, we ended up with 194 channels uh, in Slack. Uh, those are just the public ones, there are several private ones too. Um, there was a channel for every state Actually, there were two channels for every state. One was for humans, and one was for bots. So some of the things that we were talking about where people were vetting, we had a whole vetting process for if there was a tweet, was this real, was it fake, is this image real or fake? There was a whole bunch of people, mainly journalism students, uh, doing that vetting all day, all over the country. Um, and they were using a system called Check, which was, use, which was 
uh, letting us try to authenticate these tweets. Every change to those uh, to the things that were happening in Czech was being fed into the state-specific channels in Slack. So not only could we in our sort of central newsroom know what was going on in every state, but the reporters in those states, in Miami, in Wisconsin, in New York, wherever they were, were logged into those states as well. And so they could see in real time what we were doing and communicate with sort of the central uh, newsroom in New York. Uh, that we um, ended up sending 62,000 messages, uh, not all of them on election day, there were some of them a few days before election day, but most of them were on election day. We said we had 1,000 people uh, working, or I think just over 900 on that. Um, it, uh, of course, held up great. Uh, we were able to get information out to all these people. We, this ended up generating, um, um, 120 uh, stories, real-time stories, from small publications and newspapers, like I said, in Miami, at the public radio station, all up to and including uh, Univision, the New York Times, ProPublica, um, WNYC. Uh, these are all stories that really wouldn't have been able to happen had we not been able to communicate in real time. And the reporters were able to check back into the central newsroom and say, hey, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? And we had people who were on the phone, sometimes with election officials, um, mostly with reporters and experts. Um, so that's kind of how it all came together. Ben, anything else? Yeah, on the day itself was really, I mean, I'd, I'd actually been involved in um, a couple of collaborative projects before. I could talk a bit about First time. So, so the first time I was ever involved in a big kind of crowd project here was actually the San Francisco homelessness project. Does anybody know about that? People from the Bay Area. This is a day when everybody, every publication in San Francisco focuses on the one issue, which is homelessness. Now, as anybody who lives here knows, San Francisco has the highest per capita rate of homelessness of any major city in the United States. So the, the SF Homeless Project, you've got all these disparate publications of various sizes, you know, you've got the Chron San Francisco Chronicle, people like Mother Jones and so on, and BuzzFeed and all these organizations. And they're all kind of having to coordinate this, this thing, which is, is, is managing how we're going to publish everything on the same time on the same day. So I've kind of been involved with that before, so it wasn't the first time for me um, to be in a, a big Slack project, but there was something unique about the election land channel because of the way that the channels were organized. Sorry, not misuse the word channel. Um, but the, the way the channels were organized between the kind of the chatty stuff, the people chatting around, the, uh, this kind of incredible flood of information, we were feeding into that as well for each state, trying to give people tip-offs, all these busy reporters. And yet at the same time, it was kind of complimented, it wasn't on the day, by actual physical stand-up meetings as well. There was something about that, having us all together in the room too, which kind of uh, really added to that. Yeah, we were talking earlier about... Uh sort of the, the real-time nature of needing to respond to these problems as they were happening. And I think that was really one of the most powerful pieces of sort of the, the project itself and then also the tools that we had available to us is that being able to use some of the bot channels to get information out to people quickly, but then also to feed things back to reporters when they were out in the field or in the newsroom, no matter where they were. You didn't have to have their cell phone number and their desk and their email and all these other pieces, but you could actually just all be in one place all the time and people could take that with them which I think was really huge. Um, there, one is, of there is a documentary, so check it out on YouTube. You go to Google Election Land Documentary, or just Election Land on YouTube, and it show, you can actually see a reporter being called up while they're in the car and then heading to a polling station where there was a story going on just because, because of this all yeah. going on, that whole process. Teresa Frontado, who is that reporter who's right. in that documentary, was actually supposed to be with us today, but she lives in Miami, and as you may have heard, there's been some bad weather in uh, Florida, yeah. so she couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, so one of the other things that I wanted to talk a little bit about is sort of how you guys are seeing collaboration happening much more in newsrooms and in journalism in general. It's something that I see happening increasingly, and you just mentioned another one of these yeah. projects. Um, wh why is that happening, and what's it look like down the pike? I mean, I, th I think it's, I mean, it's kind of inevitable. There is something about a lot of these projects... Uh, that have, have kind of become famous uh, are quite kind of data-driven, and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think actually data journalists tend to be much more collegiate than traditional reporters. They like working with each other, and they're often they have to work on their own in their organisations, so they tend to be quite close with people in other organisations. You start to think like the Panama Papers. 
WikiLeaks, these giant investigations where actually it was too much for a single organization to do it. And so they, they, they reached out and worked with, with their partners, which would be anathema you know, 20 years ago to you know, the idea you would share your sources and stories with reporters from another organization would be kind of a weird thing to do. And now it's, it's just because, and partly that's the nature of the kinds of information we're dealing with, the, the billions of documents, the millions of documents in those particular stories, for instance, make it very, very difficult for single organizations to do it. And also there's something about skill sets required and people having these very kind of specialized skills that when you join them together, they're able to create uh, ways to handle those stories um, that would have been kind of unimaginable a few years ago. I can only see it kind of increasing because there's more and more data around, there's more and more desire for these kind of projects, and you know, they take a long time to organize. I think you're right. In the, um, the world of news nerds, uh, we <laughs> tend to be really collaborative. Um, for companies, news, you're talking about legacy organizations, newspapers, radio stations, who are intensely competitive, right? The scoop, you need the scoop. You don't want anybody to know what you're working on. Um, and that is true, and that remains to be true. Uh, even in collaborations, you, all, you don't want other people sometimes to know. Election land, by the way, was very interesting that we mm. had sort of a uh, scoop-free zone. Everybody mm. was, uh, we just agreed that everybody participating had access to all of the stories and information at the same time for that day. We just sort of wiped the slate, slate clean. No one, the, the folks from Washington Post were sitting across from folks from the New York Times and no one was uh, keeping secrets, which was really, really interesting. Um, but before that, this thing about news nerds you wouldn't share the story that you're working on, but you share the tools, right? How did I scrape that data? How did I analyze that data? How did I write that JavaScript app that would help do something? Um, and among the developers in newsrooms, where there are developers in news newsrooms, people would share all this information. The trick has been, though, that you kind of needed to have a developer in your newsroom to take advantage of the, that, those skills. And there are, there are lots of developers in newsrooms, but there's still lots and lots of newsrooms and smaller news organizations that just don't have that. Uh, and even if they do, they don't have the time or, or the patience maybe to go find the repository, download it, put it up on Heroku, make it work, whatever. Um, so that's actually something that we're uh, working with at Quartz right now. Um, under a grant from the Knight Foundation, we're developing some tools uh, specific to journalism. So there's lots of things that journalists do very often. Um, maybe it's watching a website, like a government website, in case the language changes on that website. You don't want to have to check it every day, but you'd like to have a bot do that. Um, so we're actually building a little bot uh, we're tentatively calling Quack. Um, for Quartz and Slack, kind of meshing it together. Um, and what we're doing is that, that little quack bot will have a bunch of talents, one of which will be, for example, to watch a website. And all you have to do is ask it inside Slack. And the idea here is actually to build um, these domain-specific tools for journalists, um, but in a way that uh, anybody can use. And the little secret is that Pretty much every newsroom now in the United States is using Slack. In fact, mm -hmm. I ask people at journalist um, conventions when I'm speaking before them how many don't use Slack, and usually I can count them on one or two hands. Um, <laughs> so most people are doing that. So that's yeah. already where journalists are working. So by tying these tools to a simple bot that you can just add to your team, we hope to make those kinds of specialized tools uh, that we would normally share anyway um, much easier for somebody in a small newspaper or at a small radio station or website to use just by adding that bot to Slack. So we're going to actually be rolling that out the first week in October um, at the Online News Association meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. But um, if there are journalists in the room, definitely get in touch with me and we will get you hooked up with that too. It's, it's going to be free. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because a few years ago, it was all about crowdsourcing with your audience. But now it's almost about crowdsourcing with your, your peers. Totally, yeah. And yeah, it's been really exciting about how well 
especially the nerds are sharing information, but not yeah. just the nerds. But not just the nerds. <laughs> this is what I was going to say is that I think yeah. a big thing that I saw a lot during the Election Land project was that because it was this very open project, I think more extremely so than uh, other uh, news collaborations, because we had a scoop-free zone, um, people were very willing to help each other do stuff. Uh, for yeah. newsrooms that weren't already using Slack, there was some confusion among newbies about exactly how this whole thing worked and how to update your profiles and simple bits. And the whole community was there to help. And watching that kind of just basic skill collaboration and training and um, uh, Melissa Lewis, who's a reporter at The Oregonian, uh, Oregon has almost all mail-in balloting. This project was not going to help her. She was an amazing supporter on the project, jumped in, did a bunch of great work to help train other participants around the country, even though she wasn't really going to benefit a lot from the tips that we were sharing. It was pretty incredible. Um, but I think it was sort of that thing where once you're working on one project together, it becomes very easy to build more collaborations and see the benefits of that. that you know, everybody has something different to bring to the table and something different they get to take away. And it's yeah. happening now with documenting hate. Yeah. Right. You want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So one of the projects that has sort of followed on from what we learned from election land is another collaborative reporting project called Documenting Hate, um, which is looking at hate crimes in the U.S. Um, like elections, there is no sort of single source of data federally about how many hate crimes are happening, why they're happening, who they're happening to, what kinds, et cetera. Um, again, it's all data that is collected or variously not collected at the local level. And so helping reporters understand the like broader landscape of the problem um, while also sharing access to tips. So we've put out a form um, online at documentinghate.org that uh, news organizations can also embed on their websites. And as a central organization, the project collects all of those tips, manages them, keeps the information secure, and then helps connect those stories. Um, to reporters in those particular locations so that the stories get covered. And there's a lot of back and forth between seeing what stories are covered and helping show that there's a, a lack of real reporting at the governmental accountability level for right. this kind of work. And um, we borrowed a lot of the lessons, I think, from Election Land in building out this project, and we're using Slack again to coordinate those conversations. Um, we have over 100 newsrooms, I think 150 newsrooms, working on this project already. So. The, the Document Hate channel is, um, yeah, we, we've been involved since the beginning as well because of the extension for election land and we're also supplying a, a raw feed of Google News articles because the feed that you get on Google News pages, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of algorithmically created, not humanly created and um, what, what we wanted was to be able to surface the little stories that are taking place in a little town somewhere in the Midwest, say, that are just not going to get picked up, so to add to the tip off. And we've done a bit of work with machine learning around that, around basically we've got something like 4,000 stories now and we're, we're using the, the Google Cloud natural language API to, to read through those stories. One of the interesting things about, you know, this kind of collaborative aspect of that is like election land, but over a long period of time. So rather than doing this one day, very intense experience, it's kind of, uh, the, the requirements are almost different. There are people when they, when they join the, 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 the various channels, there's, there's a channel for when you've got a byline, you can, you can share the byline. There's another channel for announcements, people to say hi, and there's one for people to, to ask kind of technical questions and so on. And those are kind of, and those are reinforced by these kind of weekly hangouts that we all have where we all kind of, you know, where people jump on and one week you'll be there with the New York Times BuzzFeed and the next week it'll be somebody from Univision and, and, um, and that's, a, which is a great combination. And there's something kind of great about the, the leveling up of information there that you've got people who don't know anything or they want to know how to use Landslide, which is the back end kind of system, and they're going on asking, uh, in my case, asking lots of dumb questions, and uh, other people are coming on and say, oh, well, actually, just do it like this, or have you seen this story we've just done? Cool. I want to make sure we leave a little bit of time for questions, so I think now would be a good time, because we're about five minutes out from the end. There's a microphone coming. Any, any questions about how we did this? Mm -hmm. Any tips? Somewhere? Yeah. There's one here. Yeah, but there's somebody here as well. Um, Hi. Um, 
My question um, deals with um, the relationships now that you guys kind of talked about with um, other news organizations and how before it was crowdsourcing and how now it's a little bit more of like getting all of the different news organizations kind of working together. Um, what do you think has um, really helped to kind of break down those like walls that were kind of there originally in journalism, like you mentioned the Washington Post and the New York Times kind of rivalry. So like what were some of the things that you think have been kind of broken down um, because of using Slack and using more tools collectively? And where do you see that eventually going? Very interesting. I think peer sourcing could be a word, is that? <laughs> Maybe that, peer sourcing. Um, there is something about, I think, I, I really think it's partly because this has come out of the nerd end of the newsroom, like, like John said, that, that actually because people kind of know each other. I mean, John and I have kind of, I've bumped into each other, known each other, the most less known each other for, for a while now, and there's, in a way that just doesn't really happen, I feel like, in other areas of journalism. And so there's something there, I think, and just the fact that actually it would be really, really difficult to do this on your own. Well, you know, collectively, you can do something you'd never be able to do individually, and that's and that, and then the, and the tools making that possible. So the fact you can just, I can ping somebody from the New York Times straight away, and that's kind of a new thing, I think. Yeah, I mean, I have a slightly different answer, which is maybe a little bit less about technology and also a little bit about sort of how the world is changing and the ways that we see much more global information. Um, I was at a conference in Paris earlier this year talking about lessons from these large-scale collaborations. And one of the things that's really stuck out to me as I started thinking about it was um, the problems that we are starting to address as news organizations have changed, we're much more interested in problems that are distributed. So it's not just looking at the one news story about the bad thing happening in your town, but saying what is the real pattern of problems here, how widespread is it, and realizing that that scope is enormous, and you actually can't cover it all yourself, particularly in an era when newsrooms have sort of a declining number of resources individually and are shrinking, so really sort of we have to do more things together. Um, one of the things that I think makes it work is also learning that you're not sharing your sources or your scoops yeah. as much as you're sharing what's the framing question and how can we all answer it. And I actually think that the homelessness project was a great example of how yeah. to do that. Yeah, and uh, that was really interesting how people were, the, the way that that was used in a way was to share, these are the stories we're going to be doing. And not in a kind of, oh great, maybe I can steal that way, but a kind of, okay, so Chronicle's doing that, that's really interesting, maybe we could do something like that which will complement those pieces. And actually, Medium had a big role in that. I, I don't know if there's anybody here from there, you know, kind of helping bring all those people together as well as a, as a way to kind of... So, yeah, not just... Share, it's kind of more sharing how you're doing something rather than, than the, the minutiae of your own personal kind of information. Mm -hmm. Here. Are you, any of you um, using Slack to push content from Slack into a CMS? And if so, are there challenges to that? Um, so at Quartz, we use Slack for um, our, uh, our CMS is a WordPress CM, CMS. So we're not, um, I'm trying to just make sure I, the, we do some things that integrate the two together. Um, Mostly, it goes the other way. We have things that keep an eye on stuff we're doing in WordPress, so editors know what's happening. And so if the reporters are writing in WordPress, um, they know uh, when a story is ready to be edited and other, th other things like that. Uh, we also sort of use um, uh, Slack as sort of the command line for a lot of the things in the newsroom. Uh, so we have some screens in the newsroom. You can actually change what is on the screen uh, through a bot in Slack, um, and some of the basic sort of operations of things. Um, and of course, if you, if some new person comes and ha happens to ask for the guest Wi-Fi password, uh, the Slack bot answers you before anybody else does. So there's some s s light integration on that. Um, and and we're, do we're obviously developing more and more of that. Um, I think we couldn't, just overall, and I sort of said this about election land, but I don't, I, I can't, I've worked in newsrooms now with Slack since the beginning of Slack, and I can't imagine working in a newsroom without Slack right now, and I don't mean that to sound super promotional, it's just true. Um, between beats and desks 
and projects and offices, different offices. We have offices around the world. Each one has their own Slack, so you can ask about something local. Um, that is how we run Quartz, um, and that's true on the business side and on the editorial side. So um, that integration, maybe not so much. The uh, interpersonal integration, absolutely. We have 30 seconds left, so if anybody has a really short question. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks.